good morning. It's Tammy with Real Southern Woman. Today we're going to start our Bible study. Well, we, we have it every day, but we're going to talk about chapter 14. And that is the prophetical books of the Old Testament. Um, this will finish up our Old Testament studies. So you have went through, let's see. Let me add them up. I could have wrote it down, I guess, but we'll just look at the book and see how many books, because I don't remember. Thirty-nine. That took a minute, didn't it? There are thirty-nine books in the Old Testament. Seventeen historical, five poetical, and 17 prophet prophetical. <laughs> and today, we are studying the prophetical books. So it's chapter 14. Let me turn to it. The prophetical books. Okay. It says that prophecy gets a grip on us like nothing else. And we are mesmerized and and we're spellbound by it. Uh, what does the future hold? This says there's an intuitive sense that a veil hangs between the human and the divine. And that prophets will help us peer beyond the veil. Outside of the Bible, however, prophets have had an uneven track record. Okay? He says that biblical prophets find themselves in a different league. Um, they are a lot different from the run-of-the-mill prophets. It also say, says that if a prophet ever voiced a prophecy that failed back in the Old Testament, he was stoned to death. So, this, may, this really discouraged the impostors and made the biblical prophets highly reliable. Um, in the Bible, we have 16 men who wrote down their messages. And these writings are called prophetical books. They compromise the final 17 books of the Old Testament, as seen in the review below. And I showed y'all that yesterday, how there's 17 um, uh, history books, 5 poetical books, and 17 prophetic prophetical books, okay? So, um, today we finished, like I said, the Old Testament. It says 12 of the prophetical books were written during the time covered in the book of Second Kings when we were reading about the kings. And remember when we read about the kings, it said that the people would be like on a roller coaster ride because they have unrighteous kings and a very few righteous kings. And at the time, um, the Hebrew people were split. There was Israel and there was Judah. And Israel was the top northern kingdom, and Judah was the southern kingdom. And for some reason, um, Judah was only two tribes, and they had more um, they had more righteous kings than the northern kingdom did. So. Um, it says that the primary message of the prophets was to stop sinning and return to the Lord. Okay? The prophets predicted what would happen to the nations if they did not heed their warnings. It says of the remaining books, two prophets, Ezekiel and Daniel, ministered during the exile, and three, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, during their return. So, it makes sense that these prophecies begun, to me, with that timeline. Because they started when, um, after um, Joshua took the, took the people back into the promised land. And after they formed a monarchy with kings. Because that's when most of the sin started. Okay? So, it would make a lot of sense that... The prophecies were during that time or started up during that time to me.
because they were there to warn the people so that they wouldn't get taken into exile. But of course, the people didn't listen, so they wound up getting exiled, okay? So it says, um, overview summary. It says, prophecy is proclaiming the word of God both for the future and the present. All right, now we're going to expand on this, and it says that there are four main features of, a prof of the prophetical writings. Four main features. The first one is called designation. D-E-S-I-G-N-A-T-I-O-N. Designation. That is major and minor prophets. Um, they just want you to know that they had two designations, the major prophets and the minor prophets. And what's so crazy about this is they're exactly what it says. The major prophets' writings were much longer than the minor prophets' writings. Go figure. So you got the designation of major and minor prophets, and the only difference in them really is that a major prophet has a bigger book than the minor prophet does. Um, number two, time period. Uh, there were prophets in the pre-exile, in the exile, uh, and the post-exile eras, which makes sense, okay? So you had prophets that warned the people pre-exile, before they were exiled, they were trying to get them to act correctly so that God wouldn't have to put them under judgment and have them taken. But of course he did. And then exile, while they're under exile or in exile, however you want to say it, um, while the other countries had control over them and they were enslaved uh, to them. And then post-exile, once... Um, the prophet came back into Jerusalem to re rebuild the temple that is post-exile. So there's there's three chronological periods, which are pre-exile, exile, and post-exile, okay? It says that most of the prophetical ministries and books occur before the exile, which makes sense. He sent the most prophets before they were exiled. Okay, it says that three prophets prophesied during the return and two primarily to Israel and seven primarily to Judah. Wait a minute. Oh, then he turns around. I don't know why he does this, but he tells us, he tells us that there's pre-exile, exile and post-exile. And then he tells us that most of them occurred during, before the exile. Then he says that three prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, prophesied during the return, which is post-exile, okay? And then he turns around and says, but the ones that did prophesy during, before the exile, um, which I think this is odd, it says that... Um, of those who prophesy before the exile, two prophesy primarily to Israel and the northern kingdom, which is the, the kingdom that had the most unrighteous kings. And then seven to Judah, the southern kingdom. Which I thought was kind of strange that he sent two prof that prophesy uh, pre-exile to the northern kingdom when they were the meanest and he sent seven to the southern when they had the most righteous people does that make sense to you i'm not sure why he did that but of course god knows why i did it um, and maybe hosea and amos i haven't looked in the book to see but maybe they're um they covered a longer period of time or something or maybe they were more more powerful prophets. Who knows? Okay, so number three, under the um, designation of major and minor prophets. That's a question I can ask Chris to study. Why he had less prophets for the most righteous 
I mean, why well, had more prophets for the most righteous? None of them were righteous, but you know what I mean. The ones who followed the law more than any of them were the southern kingdoms. And they had seven, and then the northern kingdom had two. So that don't make a whole lot of sense, but I'm sure there's something to it. So I'll have to let Chris see if he can study that for us. Foretelling uh, is the third. Um, so you've got the designation, which is major and minor prophets. You've got a time period, which is pre-exile, exile, or post-exile. And then the third thing is foretelling, which is predicted in the future. Predicted in the future is something all of us like to think about. Uh, down the road, there's a psyche, you know, and she has a nice building, y'all. <clears throat> I'm sure she lives there, probably, but it's really nice, and, and uh, I've joked around with Chris and told him I was going to go down there to the psyche, um, and I know that the Bible tells us that it really does, y'all. It tells us um uh, I'm just getting a message from Pam saying that her MRI on her brain came back clear. That's really good. Also, while I'm on that subject, she just texted me. Because um, um, I'm using my phone to record. That's how I've seen it. But Cindy, the girl that had the mastectomy, sent me a message yesterday. I didn't get it. I didn't go to bed till late yesterday. We had the craziest, busiest day. And I was looking at my comments last night. After midnight. So that's when I got Cindy's um, update on her surgery. And she says all she has to say is that it is a rough surgery, she said. Um, or she's having a rough time. So y'all keep her in your prayers. She asked me what advice I would give her. I told her not to sit on the tubes or pull on them while she's under a lot of uh, medication. You know, she could do that without knowing it so much. But, but she don't need to do that because they tug on your skin. And I told her to rest, rest, rest. <laughs> but anyway, she's home doing good. Matter of fact, when we get off of here today, I think I'm going to just post her address for those of y'all who want to send her uh, some cards of encouragement. That's for Cindy because she's one of our um, ladies that like to come on her, here. And her mama always comes on too. All right. So... I got off the subject. Anyway, I was telling y'all about that psyche. And I know the Bible says plainly that you <laughs> you got to be careful with those people. Even if they mean good, according to the Bible, it's evil. And I, I know that seems crazy, but because you see some of these psyches on TV and they're, you know, helping people reach their lost loved ones. And y'all know who I'm talking about. Uh, but according to the Bible, it's not good. Re regardless if they think they're doing good or not, it's not something that the, uh, you need to play around with. And I can study that a little bit more if you're interested in it, because I studied it one time, because I just was thinking, you know, if, if these psyches can do so, so much good for people, and why are they so, you know, why is it wrong? Why is it wrong for us to go see one? And I will, um, I will touch on that since we're talking about prophecies today. Um, but it says that the the one that is the most interesting, of course, and it is for us today, is somebody that can tell the future, of course. And it says the most famous characteristic of a prophet is that he can occasionally predict the future. Okay, this is not an ability inherent within himself; rather, the information is given to him by God. Okay, the prophecies of the Bible are are inspired by God to warn his people. Um, it, it, it's not like, you know, he's saying, you know, in five years you'll get married and you'll have two kids and, and somebody's going to, you know, mess it up or whatever. It's not like that. It's, it's much, much bigger than that. Okay, so these prophets were um, the way that God spoke to the people. All right. God always found a way to talk to his people uh, before the New Testament, before Jesus Christ came. He always had different ways of reaching his people. And during this time period, it was prophecy. Okay? So in Israel, the test of a true prophet 
was that he must be 100% accurate. And if he wasn't, of course, like I said, he was stoned to death. So you know you didn't open your mouth unless you knew what you were talking about. Okay? So then there's forth telling, which means you're proclaiming the teachings of God, which is pretty easy, you know, just uh, telling people what God's law was, telling people to adhere to the laws and the commandments of God. Um, it was very, it was much more common in the prophets uh, to be this type of prophet instead of a future telling prophet, okay? So it says that these prophets that proclaimed the teachings exposed sin and called people to, to a higher moral uh, lifestyle, okay? It says they warned of judgment of the, if the people did not reform, and they proclaimed the coming of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, okay? That's what these prophecies, pro I guess, I can't even think. Prophecy people did. How's that? I can't even think. The prophet, that's what I'm trying to think of. The prophets usually warned about judgments related to the nation of Israel or Judah being military conquered and taken out of the land. And we know that happened because we talked about um, the exile with Joshua and um, how not, was it, it wasn't Joshua, it might have been Daniel. No, I get them all mixed up. Joshua led the conquest. Daniel, uh, I think, was involved with the exile. I'm trying to remember it off the top of my head. You know, you think I'd have a cheat sheet right here in front of me since I'm the teacher, right? Daniel was the exile. I didn't say I had to get it right. Because now that we know that these prophetical books were written uh, pre-exile, during the exile, and post-exile, then the person attached to those times on our timeline should be a prophet, which is Daniel. Joshua wasn't a prophet, okay? All right, so it says there's four main features of the prophetical books, and that we already went through them. So the number one was uh, designation. The major and minor prophets, two, was time period, pre-exile, exile, and post-exile. Three was foretelling, predicting the future. And four was foretelling, proclaiming the teachings of God. And that is it. Now, he gives us a little map in the book to show us where the geography of the prophetical books took place. And they were in Israel, Jerusalem, and Judea. Israel, Jerusalem, and Judea are all in between the Mediterranean Sea, uh, the, the, the piece of land that's in between the Mediterranean Sea, the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, and the Dead Sea, okay? Then Edom was down below the Dead Sea. That was another place. Assyria is at the top of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in between them. And Babylonia is in the fork of the rivers at the bottom on the map, okay? Those are the places that these prophecies took place. Now, we're going to read our final um, little tidbit here because we are finishing up the Old Testament. Can you believe we're finishing up the Old Testament already? We're almost halfway through, um, it says. And so um, I'm going to read you what he says because it's exciting. I hope y'all have gained a lot of knowledge about the Old Testament. You kind of know um, how it's put together now. It's really kind of cool, okay? And even if I make mistakes, I mean, so what? If I called uh, Daniel, G uh, Joshua, at least I got the the people in my head right. I just got to put them together in the right in the right order. <laughs> it's just a lot of information to put in your head over thirteen lessons. This is the fourteenth lesson today. It says, "Wonderful, you have now completed section one, the story of the Old Testament." Don't that feel good, y'all? 
And it says this is a major milestone in understanding the Bible, and it really, really is. The remaining sections have been structured so that they are challenging girls. So he's, I guess he's saying this hasn't been too challenging. Uh, it says, but they're not overwhelming. If you completed the Old Testament, you can complete the entire book. And you're almost halfway through it. Okay? Now, having just overviewed the poetical and prophetical, prophetical books of the Old Testament, and having seen where they fit into the story of the Bible, we are ready to continue that story as we begin. Section 2. Praise the Lord, the story of the New Testament, Jesus Christ, okay? So um, we are doing good. This book is so good. I encourage you to get this book. Even if you uh, think you don't have the money or whatever, don't go out to eat somewhere for a couple of times. Save your money and buy this book. It is so much easier to learn this information if you have the study guides, the fill in the blanks um, in this book. The cool thing about this book is if you do teach a Sunday school class or something like that, or you want to do a home Bible study, this book has a teacher's uh, guide in the back of it. And it also, this book, you don't have to buy a separate book to be the teacher guide. And it also has uh, sheets that you're allowed to download off of line, offline and use during your studies um, as the teacher. Okay, now I haven't done this because we're on a little screen right here, and it would be too hard for me to do this. But if you're in that kind of setting, this book is set up for you. Okay, uh, pages 270, I think it starts on 275. I'll show it to you right quick. It has an appendix, which it has a lot of the uh, sheets and stuff. But see this? It'll be backwards because I'm not on my uh, iPad. But it has a teaching plan. Now, it gets, it gets real extensive in what all you can do to help teach this. I mean, so much more than what we've done because you've got a classroom. You can sit in a circle, and you can ask different people to study different things. And, you know, and, talk, and then you talk about it when you come together. And the study sessions that he gives you as a teacher are 45 minutes, which we, we're just reviewing, okay? Um, but I just thought I'd throw that in there. So it is a good book. It's not just for women, of course. It's for anybody who wants to understand the Bible. Um, so I hope that y'all have kind of got a grasp on the Old Testament. If I just tried out of my own mind to do a review of the Old Testament, uh, try to do that. Just take a piece of paper and write down the things that you can remember, the things that you know that for sure you've learned, and then the things that you are not as good at or cannot bring to memory as much, because we're all going to have certain parts that interest us more than others, okay? Um, so you can write, the, just write them down without, any, without the book. Just write it down and see where you are with the Old Testament. Then you can go back, open up your book, and see how you did and how much you learned about the geography, about the time, the eras. Um, you've got the creation era, the patriarch era, the Exodus era, the conquest era. So you kind of have to close your eyes and think, okay, after the Exodus era, what would come next? And then you think, well, Moses brings the people out of Egypt, but he doesn't take them to the promised land. So the next one's the promised land. So it's the conquest. Okay. And you just keep going and going. So write, you know, try to write them down. And think about who they were, why they were there, what they were doing. And then the poetical and the prophetical books kind of just go into place. And it makes very good sense to me uh, that now the poetical books, they started in the, Job started in Genesis, it said, which just amazes me. But um, 
but the prophetical books are right in place. Why wouldn't they be after the kings took over? You know, God always had a man over his people. Always. His own man over his people. And then the people cried out, we want a king. We want a king like everybody else has a king. That was not what God wanted. Uh, so, of course, they had righteous and unrighteous kings over them, which was really, really a bad choice that they made as a people. Um, but very few of the kings really loved God, okay? Uh, because the people appointed those people, not God, okay? Do you see the difference? Now, did God have his hand in it? I'm sure he did some, uh, just like he has his hands in our people that rule, uh, because he can make us do things if he really wants something done. But he lets us make choices, and he gives us a will, and that's a good example of that. You know, he could have just said, absolutely not. I'm your God. You know, he could have just really slammed it to him and said, you're not going to have a king. You know, you're going to follow a man like you've always done, like Moses um, or Abraham. Uh, but he didn't. He let the people choose their own will, just as he lets us choose our own will on whether or not we're going to worship him, whether or not we're going to get up every day and look at his word and pray and think about him, or whether or not we're going to get up and just think about ourselves and the world that we live in. Okay, so he gives us choices. Um, that shows right there that he's in control and he's sovereign, but he doesn't have us on a string like a puppy, okay? And he doesn't have the people who get saved on a string either, all right? It's up to us. Um, let's say our prayers. I hope y'all have a wonderful, blessed Thursday. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for being able to come together in this uh, United States of America where we can get up and have a Bible, or 15 Bibles for that matter, not worry about somebody knocking on our doors and taking them away from us, because then we would never see your word except what we had put in your heart, put it in our hearts from you. But I thank you that we do live in a place that we can study your word. I pray that we do study your word enough that it does adhere into the hearts and minds of us, and that we remember some of these things that we are learning about and that you will help us um, put it together and help us understand it. Um, be with us as we go throughout our day. May we shine our Christian light of love for you and show that you are a real and true and special God and that we are different because we are your children. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Marilyn's here, Linda's here, Christy, Sherry, Teresa, Donna, Carol. I'm not sure if everybody's still here, but I love all of you girls. And I will post that address uh, so that y'all can send her a get well card, okay? And I'll also, I may try to get my cousin, it's actually my cousin's wife, her address. If I try, if I get her address, I'll post it too, but we definitely want to send Cindy one because she's part of our group. Okay? Love you all. Bye. And if you want to know, I'll, I'll just put it in the post. Bye, y'all.